Christopher Art Wolf's career has spanned five decades, which is a true testament to the relevance of his work, his expertise as a teacher, and his passionate advocacy for saving indigenous cultures of the world and the environment. He has taken over two million photos in his lifetime to date and still travels nine months out of the year. He's released over 80 books and produced for television, most recently in his PBS series, Travels to the Edge. He's been all over the world multiple times and never tires of visiting his favorite places on the planet. He began his journey as a fine artist with paint and pencil, but found that photography suited his fast-paced inner rhythm better, so he switched over and never looked back. More recently, his work has shifted to include a combination of the two in his recent works called Human Canvas, recently opened at the Rotella Gallery in New York City. How all this happened is a story unto itself. Not long ago, my friend Lori Rubin and I hit the trail on a photo trip to Washington State. Lori already knew Art, and he graciously agreed to sit down with us for a chat. What's more, though, he invited us to do this at his home overlooking Puget Sound. Now, Lori warned me in advance that his garden was jaw-dropping, but when we arrived, I realized that Art Wolf isn't just a world-renowned photographer, he's a master gardener, and that is where he recharges his own batteries. His home is his sanctuary and it reflects a lifetime of embracing the planet and its people with a heart as big as the heavens above. Art Wolf is focused, funny, passionate, incredibly talented, well-spoken, and has a unique perspective on life, art, and what makes one's time on this planet worth getting out of bed for. I am humbled, honored, and thrilled to present to you Art Wolf. Hey everybody, it's Karen Hutton and The Chat with Karen Hutton and a very special episode that it is because for two reasons. One, for the very first time ever, I have a special co-host in Miss Lori Rubin. <laughs> we're here in Washington State on a fantastic photo trip and guess who agreed to talk to us? The mighty Art Wolf. Mighty. <laughs> <laughs> Art Wolf, as you heard in the intro, is... Practically a living legend, and uh, and boy, we have so many questions. Again, we could go for an hour, but we're going to keep on track and jump in with um, the thing about you, Art, is you have this incredible, vast, you know, experience. But now, at this point in your life, it's all kind of boiling down to this very sort of pure artistic place, which I just love, and my audience really relates to it, as do I. Um, and one of the things that you do when you shoot, or, or you, that kind of informs you of when to shoot, is this thing, and I heard you talk about this, that it has to do with, oh, that looks like a Matisse, that looks like a Van Gogh, and that is one of your indicators, I call them indicators, um, of the shot. Yeah, you know, I, I think there's a huge challenge for everybody as a photographer. Mm -hmm. You know, it's... Avoiding the cliches. Everybody would see El Capitan uh -huh. or Bridal Veil Falls or the Grand Canyon or up here in Washington State, Mount Rainier, but there's a lot more to photography than that. Yes. It's finding the shots that most people pass by. And so what I do is draw on my history right. as a painter. And I took an inordinate amount of art history. And so I draw upon my knowledge of the vast variety of artists that I studied from uh -huh. the Impressionist period all the way up to modern abstract expressionism. And if something reminds me of a Matisse or a Van Gogh or a Renoir, I have it in my brain, I connect the dots and I see the shot. Other things like the elements of design and uh, which would be line, texture and patterns, mm -hmm. those are also those little red dots blinking out there in that mm -hmm. vast mm -hmm. 360 degree world that we walk through, looking for photos. Exactly, and, and I often tell the people that I work with that indicators, I call it an indicator, it could be a gut feeling, it could be that you hear music, I tend to hear music and it's, or hear dialogue from film, or you know, see a color scheme or something like that, and that, it's like, I can literally take my camera and all of a sudden it goes, 
Whoa. And I'm like, oh, it's in there. <laughs> I, I, I think, yeah, I, there's a lot of people that are musically inclined that hear music when they see wind blowing or yep. water flowing or whatever it may be. Yeah, exactly. I think that's just fascinating. Mm -hmm. I do too. Yeah. And I think the red lights are going off, or green lights should be, uh, going off in my audience when I'm talking about uh, making that in, you know, perfect comparison between a Picasso and an abstract that's directly drawn line. Exactly. I've and seen actually pictures side by side yeah. that you've, um, on one of your workshops. You yeah, I do that about. routinely when I give lectures and people are going, oh, now we get what you're that's saying. Right. Mm -hmm. There's another thing that now you're focusing on, which again, I just think is so, it doesn't seem like it, but to me when I think about three words, like I often say to people, you know, what, what describes you now? What word describes you now? Well, you have three words that, inf that not only is like the, the branding and it's like what you're all about, but it really, the thing I find fascinating about it is when you choose them well and they, and they really, really describe you, they, they begin to really inform you. I agree. It's and explore, it's create and inspire. And explore is what we've been talking about, looking for a shot, going out into your environment and looking for the shot. Then it's framing it, creating the shot, uh -huh. and ultimately, and I've said this before, I shoot for the enjoyment of other people. And yeah. so I love the fact that my work, the efforts I put into anything, is inspir inspiring other people. You know, we're yeah. communicating. Yeah. Uh, photographers are communicating. Well, when you think about it, it's like, it's great to shoot for yourself, but if nobody ever sees it or wants to see it, why? Well, uh, it's why such do an it? obvious uh, um, parallel between writers and musicians, performers of any type. They are performing for the enjoyment of other of other people. Right. I mean, it's no less true as a photographer. I'm shooting for the enjoyment and more importantly the inspiration of other people right. and all, and more now than ever before I recognize the value of that. It's amazing how as the more you go on and on and on in life you just start to realize wow it's really pretty simple and it's a big task yeah. to, to, to really step up and give this thing. Well I mean on a gut level if you think about it if you are uh, if you have this passion mm -hmm. and you're sharing that passion with other people and you're helping them find that passion leads to happiness yes and if you're a happy camper you infect the people around you so in a way you're providing a really valuable you know contribution Huge. to the greater society and Huge. i mean that without any hesitation or smirk on my face i really believe that and i really think that when like people often say well how do I be successful as a photographer? Well, I think that is more the key to it, to distill down what, what you have that the world needs. Yeah. What do you stand behind that the world really needs and you need to get it out there instead of how much money can I make and where's... It, My, blah, blah, blah. Money has been the least yeah. uh, interest of myself. Right. You know, I fill myself, uh, my life with art and... Things that are not necessarily expensive. I work an inordinate amount of time in my garden. These are things that I surround myself. Mm -hmm. I've got a little Fiat, you know, a tiny little car. I, I'm not into cars. I'm not into jeweler, jewelry. I'm not into a lot of things that people would deem really precious. Right. But what's precious to me is a beautifully shaped pine tree or an old artifact mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. most people wouldn't even appreciate. I find value and appreciation for. And as a result, your whole life is like an art. Absolutely. You. If you're going to be an artist, live like an artist. I teach that in my workshops as well because there's an amazing amount of people that they love taking pictures, but it's relegated to a couple hours, maybe one day a week or on weekends occasionally. And it's like, no, if you really have photography as a passion, surround yourself with that. Live it. Breathe it. It will make you live longer. And start seeing the things that only you see. Yeah. Because that's the thing is people say, well, what should I shoot? And it's not very interesting. I'm like, but you are interesting and you are unique. So what do you see? What do you feel? Get that emotion and get that feeling across no matter what. We're sitting here in your beautiful house. Yeah. Surrounded by this lush landscape and views of the mountains. Art, how do you leave this place and travel around the world? I would just stay here. It's so beautiful. Well, you know, here it's because I've created, you know, there's waterfalls on the property now. 
you know, ones with recycling water. The sound of water is nourishing the soul, right? When you come home. I spend too much time, you know, strapped in coach, uh, traveling the world. But when I come home, the very peacefulness of this place, the sound of water, the, the visual delights, uh, absolutely transport me instantly into an environment that really makes me at ease and comforts me and nourishes me and all those things that a good environment should do. Mm -hmm. So I get an intense amount of pleasure being here, albeit for a short time before I have to go out. I want to go actually out. You know, that's a really interesting point I've just made. I would go crazy staying in any place very long. So though I love this place and I'm here for maybe at best 10 days at a stretch, I really have this desire to go out and explore more. Isn't yeah. that interesting? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm not a vacation years. kind of person. <laughs> no, no, well, see, but why do you need a vacation? Because you're not living your life as an art, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I believe that. <laughs> I know, I do too. You wouldn't know that directly from your own experience, but you believe it. You know, once uh, I was hired by uh, Islands Magazine to go and photograph uh, Bora Bora and they wanted me down there for two weeks. I said, how big is this island? They said, well, you can drive around it in 15 minutes. I said, I will do the assignment if I only can go, go down there for about five days. Really? After five days, I've done it. I'm never going to lay on a beach. Forget about that. Yeah. So I did it five days. That's awesome. Well, the point That's is awesome. that most people would want to go down there for three weeks, but a small island in the South Pacific, yeah, I'm good for five days yeah. and I want to move on. Where, yeah, where would you go from there? Home. Okay. <laughs> That's right. Because you, don't you usually go and go different places? Well, here I, I'm leaving uh, on Thursday morning and I'm heading to Germany to give a, a talk. And two weeks later, I'm going to be in Germany giving another talk. And I was thinking, do I really want to spend two solid weeks in Germany waiting for the next talk? So I'm coming all the way back home really? to work in my garden and then I'll wow. go back. Nine hour investment, wow. both, you know, four times is better than spending two weeks spending money and wasting my time. So you and I have another, um, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Well, I just thought this doesn't play well in Germany. I love Germany, but you know, unless I have an agenda, I would go crazy. Yeah. Well, that's true wherever you are. So that's, yeah. that's not Germany specific. So that's okay. Okay. So we'll, we'll go <laughs> Um, you and I have another interesting uh, commonality. We were talking earlier about kind of like simpatico on some things. And one of them is you were talking about how creative people live longer. So the Impressionists, you know, back in the day, they lived into their 80s when people were dropping dead in their 30s and maybe 40s. And, and I know this from voice and because they did studies, you know, on what professions live the longest. And it's, you know, singers, conductors, and another voice-driven profession I'm going blank on right now. But the, my point is that they were they related it to the breath, the use of breath and oxygenation in the system. But you have talked about it as creative people simply living longer. Well, I, I have no doubt that what you're saying is absolutely true, that people that learn to breathe properly, I'm not one of them. <laughs> but <laughs> related to but how that, do you know? well, I just know <laughs> because, you know, uh, I've spent most of my career as a wildlife photographer and you hold your breath and you just well, try nice. to get that shot. And I have very shallow breathing, huh. very quiet breathing. And there's times where I get, <gasps> I have to kind of breathe in yeah. because I've forgotten to breathe. Now, <laughs> yoga would be good for that. But I think related to what you're saying, and this is a staggering statistic, is that the average man lives 18 months after retirement. Really? And what that really speaks to is they don't have passion and passion could be photography or it could be gardening it could be anything that somebody finds and fills their life right an agenda that nourishes their soul we say that uh again and so for us it's photography and it's gardening for me and it's going to see movies i love movies me too. you have that yeah. in common yeah uh but it's finding something that is beyond work and a lot of poor souls spend their entire life working in any industry, but they haven't prepared for retirement. Right. So they retirement and they may, maybe they're into golfing for a little bit and they go golfing and after that they kind of watch TV and then they kind of wonder what to do and right. they just go away. And I think that's tragic. I do too. So when I'm teaching now, most of my uh, students are between 50 and 70 years old. 
I love that. I love that. that was one of my next things. And they're very successful women and men in their profession. And now they've found photography. Maybe it's through the di digital era. Uh -huh. But they've found photography, and now they are excited. And I'm almost like an evangelist on stage. Right. I'm talking not just about photography, but I'm talking about living right. and filling one's life with something mm -hmm. that really turns them on and makes them live longer. Right. I mean, we were talking about this house and how it's hard right. to leave. But if you look around this house, it's also filled with the memories of my life. Mm -hmm. I started collecting right after when I first started traveling. Mm -hmm. So every single trip, I just returned from New Guinea. Mm -hmm. I brought back a mask from the uh, mm -hmm. Sepik River. But I look around this room and it's where I've been mm -hmm. and what meant something to me. And so as my memory fades, because I'm like everybody else, early 60s, start to lose that short-term memory, I have everything to kind of remind me of where I've been. Mm -hmm. And it's all part of my life right here. And I love sharing that. And this house inspires people. I've yeah. kept it open and uh, filled with art because I also open the house to organizations that I support. Oh, wow. That's really cool. So they love coming into this old house, and uh, the house has got a lot of character. There's not a straight angle in the house. Doesn't matter to me. It's oh, filled right. with art. Exactly. I was here a couple of years ago when you did a wonderful workshop on composition, which actually changed the way I looked through my viewfinder forever, so thank you on that. But wow. it was really wonderful to have students here because we, we feel who you are. This is... Yeah. It's like we're in one of your images, and it's wonderful that you share that and open your house to people. You know, when I was around eight years old in grade school, I remember going on a little field trip in the spring down to this house near the grade school, and it was uh, filled with little lacquerware and things that a woman collected. And I can remember that to this day. Yeah. I mean, I've forgotten the entire decades, but I remember sitting around in her house and smelling lacquerware from Japan, and it just intrigued me to yeah. travel. Yeah. So it's inspiring. I was inspired by many people during my lifetime, and I think I pay for that forward as well. Yes, that's fantastic. So we're, we're getting near the end of our, of, our, of our chat, but I have a few more questions. One of them, and I'm not sure there's, a, there's an easy, ready answer for it, but I was thinking about this because you have your traveling and your photography. You have galleries, multiple of them, and you're opening a new one with this new, with the new work that you're doing in New York. I know how it's stacked for me. I know what is at the. I know what my three words are. My point is that informs all the rest, or the the, the thing inside, or my message, or who I stand for. And I was, and so I know the order. So, do what is the what is the order for you? Do you know, or is that? Yeah, I, I I think the word I've used quite a bit in this interview is inspire. You know, the garden is inspiring. I mean, I, of course, do it for myself, but perfectly in sync with my audience, I inspire them. Yeah. And so I love to delight people and mm -hmm. inspire people, mm -hmm. uplift people, because God knows that there's a lot of negativity in the world right now. Uh, we live at a time that if somebody gets murdered in Miami, we hear about it on the nightly news. And so people that are, people ought to actually turn off the TV unless, it, of course, it's travels the, to the edge <laughs> but they once in a while give themselves a break and turn off the news yeah and I do. it's I not do. that you want to keep yourself uninformed but at a certain point you also have to let go of that you know worrying about everything is not going to solve a, a lot of major issues now i sound like the the owner of the clippers uh <laughs> Heart, heart rants, but I do believe that uh, I'm very protective of my own psychology. Yeah, me too. Seriously, I me think too. the line between sanity and insanity is often crossed by normal people when they mm -hmm. just blow a gasket and right. get upset over nothing. Right. Uh, so you know, even in movies, if I if I know somebody's going to be uh, stabbed or killed, I'll always look away and get back to the. I just me protect too. my psychology. Yep. Hugely. My mother did that. Mm -hmm. And I fill my life with positive things. Yep. And when I go out, I try to infect that into my audience. And they come away buoyant and ready to yep. shoot and uplifted. And if that's my gift, if that's what my legacy is, I'll take that over photography any day. I'll say that I left people happier. And I just believe in doing that. Thank you. And that's true. That. I believe you.
Okay, so the section of my show is called Random Questions. So they're just offbeat, whatever, you know, questions. So this is one. Um, if you had 30 seconds to talk to your 20-year-old you, what would you say? Stay the course. I actually, I, I grew up <laughs> in, a, uh, my parents l allowed me to do anything I want. I was the third of three. I was never given a curfew. I really? was never given any rules because I think they recognized in me that I had an agenda at even seven years old. Yeah. I had little bird books, mammal books. I was a naturalist. I wouldn't change anything that I was at 20 because I'm just an older 20 at this point. Right. Excellent, excellent mm -hmm. answer. I hope you're listening. This is, this is wisdom talking yes. to you right Total now. Total wisdom. Total <laughs> wisdom. What's your favorite plant? Well, I think my favorite plant, well, see, I'm, I, it would have to be the black pine. Really? I love black pines. They're throughout my garden. And one of the reasons wow. is that you can shape them so easily. Uh, you know, they only uh, come from Japan. And um, the, the Japanese embrace black pine because you could pull a branch down and in six months it's going to be there. Really? Whereas most trees, if you pull them down with a guy wire, they're going to gonna flip right back up. Right. So you can create such beauty really? with the bonsaiing of black pine. So you paint with plants too, essentially. You create with plants. Yeah, everything. I love it. I love that. Um, if you could paint, paint a picture of scenery that you've seen before, like in your travels, what, what, what would the one, if there is just one, what would it be? I don't, memory. Like well, a, I'm going to dodge that because I don't think I'm even painting landscapes. I historically painted landscapes when I was an art major, and today I'm painting abstracts and cultural photos. So your, your question is kind of related, though. What landscape would I like to be in, perhaps? That's, well, that's part of it, but then you, I was going to go your direction. It could go both ways toward what you're doing now, and so what landscape would you want to be in? What if you could paint it and then step into it? You know, I keep getting drawn back to Huan Shan. Really? Yeah, I was on the first Western expedition to Tibet in, in the winter of 1984, right after uh, Nixon opened up relations with China. A lot of my friends were, China, uh, were Boeing engineers, and they parlayed that connection with the Chinese government, which were purchasing planes, into this permit mm -hmm. that was highly sought after and rarely given out, and we were given it. Wow. Um, and so on the way back from three months on that ice cube of a mountain, I stopped in Huan Chan, and it was this amazing landscape that up to that point, I thought, you know, the great Chinese masters were all high on opium as they were creating these fanciful landscapes. And then I visited Huan Chan, Yellow Mountain, Sacred uh -huh. Mountain, and it looked just like the paintings. So really? it was landscapes I had never seen before, these sweeps of granite spires with twisted pine trees and swirling mists. So much so that when I came back and purchased this old house, I started uh, six months later in recreating a mini version of Huan Shan. So wow. that's the landscape I keep getting drawn back to Isn't because at, at first it's a photograph, but it also resembles watercolor paintings. Right. Because I've seen those paintings and I was like, and I saw, in fact, recently I was looking at, I don't, I don't know the name of the artist, but it was of the Yellow Mountain. I was like, where is this? And it was Yellow Mountain. And well, you know, and just, just to close on that, it's the landscape that when I walk through and I've been there now, probably 10 times by representing probably 30 days of exploring the trails. Every vista I look out, I'm still amazed that this is a natural landscape. And it is. It's all natural. Wow. You know, natural bonsai by the winds that sweep up the, right. the slope. Right. That's fantastic. If you were immortal for a day, what would you do? What's that mean to me? What does immortal... You could do anything and not hurt yourself or die or <laughs> and you had pa actually if you were immortal super would you would you have powers superpowers right along with this what would your superpower be for a day you had you had you were immortal and you and you're in your own and your own real true superpower what would it be <laughs> mm -hmm. i am stumped on that question and the reason is 
I'm almost been able to fulfill any dream I've ever had. In other words, think about this. And this sounds like a dodge, but it's no, it's no, true. It's just you know, I've dove with great white sharks. I've photographed wild pandas. I've seen wild snow leopards. I've gone to the world's greatest landscapes. I've been in the heart of the Amazon photographing tribes that are at best middle age, meaning they've got machetes, but nothing else. Uh, I've gone and lived my dream for the last 35 years. And so given, you know, if you could be anything or be it, it's, it's like a, a stump because there's nothing that I desire at this point. I told that to my 90 year, 94 year old father that don't worry about me, take care of yourself. I've lived the life of more than a hundred different people. I could die tomorrow a happy person mm -hmm. because I've done everything that I've ever wanted to do. And that's, my, that's why I'm stumped with this question because there's very little things that I desire that I haven't already done and lived. Well then, I have another question. Okay, you said it earlier that men over a certain age, once they retire, like I was going to ask you what does retirement look like for you, but that's the wrong word and I didn't want to get into redefining it and everything because I don't mean it in the traditional sense. My dad never retired. I'll never retire. So that's what will keep you going. It's yeah. just ongoing. The, 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 even the concept of retiring has... I know. Really, I, I can verbalize shifting it, but I've never thought well, it. Well, you are shifting gears and that's not retirement, but you're shifting gears with your with your next form of art that you Well, exactly, but I'm not even shifting gears because of age. I've just I know. constantly evolved my, uh, as I've uh, matured as a person, my intellect is more refined, my, I'm, you know, that's the greatest gift this uh, art school ever gave to me, was never be complacent, never feel like you've, you know, you've arrived, so to speak. Right. Um, and I've never sat back and say, okay, I've, I'm on the epitome, you know, I'm, uh, I can't even say the word. <laughs> I've never felt that I have achieved everything I wanted in terms of art. personal goals or art. Yeah. Or, so I've never sat back arrogantly and thought, okay, I've done it. I've never felt that, nor have I been miserably uh, feeling like, like I'm inadequate. I've always put that carrot slightly beyond my reach. So I'm moving forward and evolving and sh I will unquestionably be a better observer and therefore a photographer next year than I am now right and I, and so forth so I'm always work in progress so it's always renewal always renewal rebirth all those things mm -hmm. and that's one of the reasons that I believe that after 40 years of doing this almost seven days a week I'm still as enthusiasm as enthusiastic right. as I've ever been okay. and that is what I also try to demonstrate in my classes yeah that is a fantastic uh, ending note for this. Art Wolf, thank you so much. Thank you for having me on your show. Absolutely. I'm so grateful. You've just given us a huge gift. People, you should listen to this over and over again, as well as if, uh, Photographer Talk at Google, because there's wisdom and knowledge steeped throughout. And I really, really appreciate it. Thanks, Karen. I sound like I'm making light, and I'm not. Um, thank you. And thank you for joining us. And um, we'll be back next time. But you should watch this one again. Bye. <laughs>
but by pruning it back, you keep keep it really small and... How do you prune it so that it doesn't look chopped off at the top? It just, uh, when you do chop it off, I mean, this one was been bonsai since it was very, very small. Wow. So trees kind of heal over. But all, this is a classic black pine. And look how elegant the shape is. It's beautiful. So that's what they use. I had no idea. So every, I've got like 20 black pines. That's a red pine. I, I get too demoralized trying to work on that one because I don't see great benefits. So I right. have friends You're right. This is actually so beautiful. Yeah. Oh. I bought it from a, a, a guy in, uh, north of Seattle. But look at it. It looks like it's been in here for years. So wow. it, you have to be a carpet layer with moss. Yep. And I had a couple friends help me move these rocks and suddenly it's got a place. So yeah, I just love creating art in all these different little I love places. I smell. I can smell this tree. Well, I go in, I at, in the evening pitch. and I'm covered in pitch. So there's a, a, a substance called goos, gugon or goo. Yes, go, yeah. Yeah, I have to bathe in that stuff because I'm just virtually covered in pitch. I love it.